good evening once again. Thank you to the people who are who are still here. <laughs> organizing ourselves over here. So for the two-seat Lamoille two-house district, which represents Belvedere, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Wolcott, incumbent Democrats Matt Hill and Dan Noyes, both from Wolcott, face a challenge from Mike King of Johnson, who's running as an independent. So you saw the format there. We'll do it about the same way. Uh, candidates will have up to two minutes for an opening statement. And then we will uh, we will ask you questions. We'll alternate the order. Um, we have a bunch of new questions, so <laughs> thank you for our audience. So we're you can't cheat on the test. yeah, you can't <laughs> cheat on the test for this one. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I will. Um, do you have any questions, candidates? First of all, no. Okay. Yes, they do. Those waters are new for you, so. <laughs> Drinks already drinks online. <laughs> yep. So. <clears throat> so I guess I'll go in uh, in this order, running down the table. So we'll start with Matt Hill of Wolcott, who was born and raised in Johnson. Uh, he's been part of the Vermont Department of Labor Administration and also worked in carpentry and real estate. Uh, as a former basketball player, coach, and referee, he said he thrives on teamwork and in high-pressure situations. He is the clerk of the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development, the Right to Repair Task Force, of which he's the co-chair. So, Matt Hill. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, Matt Hill from Johnson. I live in Wilkett now. Um, <clears throat> this uh, first biennium for me was uh, exciting. I had worked in the building before, but... Uh, I was more of uh, the administration side of things, and I wasn't uh, in the mix so much. Uh, and it's a very brand new experience, and it was a ton of fun, really. I mean, it's, uh, it's, as, it's as crazy as you want to make it. Um, I don't think people quite understand the amount of work uh, that goes into every day in that building. It's, uh, it's a rat race 24-7, um, and it can be as fun as you want to make it to be, or you can sit back and not do anything if you want, um, but, uh, but I chose to do the, the former and uh, I worked my butt off to try to get some stuff done. I ended up having a bill passed um, that uh, I sponsored and ushered through the building and it was signed by the governor uh, and it was uh, the social media privacy bill. Um, and uh, I think it was a good step. We see, especially more than ever, and I think it was gonna continue to happen is uh, you know, more data breaches, um, we just had a Facebook one not too long ago, and of course we had uh, the Equifax breach that affected pretty much the entire country. Um, and on that side of things, my committee uh, did a ton of work on trying to get a handle on data brokers, people who buy and sell your personal information um, without your knowledge. Uh, and I, it's kind of a, it's, it's not necessarily a new arena, but it's becoming more troublesome as the internet grows um, and, uh, you know, it's a little eerie having your very personal information being bought and sold by a bunch of people who you have no idea who they are, where they are. You've never had a business relationship with that group or person. Um, and it's, uh, it's certainly worrying now more than ever. Uh, so uh, in my committee, we did a lot of work on, this, on the data broker bill, and I don't believe the governor signed it, if I remember correctly. Um, so that will be another issue going forward, and I hope that uh, the legislature continues to, to work on um, privacy issues. Thank you, Matt. Next up, we have Dan Noyes, uh, who lives in Wolcott. He's been there for 15 years, was in Hyde Park before that. Uh, he graduated from Johnson State College with a degree in environmental science and has a certification of nonprofit management from Marlboro. Uh, he's worked for 20 years for the Central Vermont Council on Aging as a coordinator and is the director of RSV pre, RSVP, excuse me, um, a program that engages seniors in the service of others. Uh, his nonprofit and volunteer work also includes the Vermont Commission on National and Community Service, uh, the Farmers Veterans Coalition, Vermont Automobile Enthusiasts, the United Way and the Lamoille Wood Bank, AARP, the Osher Lifelong Learning Committee, He's been on the Wolcott Planning Commission. Uh, he's coordinated the Wolcott Ski and Snowboard Program. He's on, or has been on the Friends of Lamoille Valley Rail Trail Board, uh, president of the Lamoille River Anglers, and more about the United Way. Um, he currently serves on the House Committee on Human Services, uh, the Canvassing Committee, and the Human Services and Educational 
Facilities Grant Advisory. He's everywhere. Thank you, Hannah and Tommy, for and the News and Citizen for hosting this debate. I'm honored to have represented the communities of Belvedere, Johnson, Hyde Park, and Woolkit for the past two years. I'm running for re-election, and I ask for your vote on November 6. As you just said, I serve on the Human Services Committee, and it's our job to oversee the agencies that support the health and welfare of older Vermonters, children, and families. If re-elected, I will continue to develop creative ideas to increase accountability and cohesion across state agencies and service providers. Together, our committee worked to improve the outcomes within the foster care system this last session. We created programs to reduce the benefits cliff by incentivizing young families to save for college and retirement. We have challenged state agencies and our partners to undertake evidence-based programming with the goal of reducing the occurrence of adverse childhood experiences. We made sure our state continues to plan and strategize for the aging population by making sure programs are accountable, working together and preparing to deliver services so older Vermonters can live with dignity and respect. As one of 150 legislators, I'm committed to address the issues that will affect older Vermonters and I'm proud to have started the Older Vermonters Caucus that brings together legislators and senators across party lines to build consensus and discuss issues like repealing the tax on Social Security, workforce engagement, and access to services. In this upcoming session, I'll protect Northern Vermont University and look for creative ways to reduce the crushing debt many young people graduate with. We also need to focus on our tech center and to make sure students graduate with the skills and training they needed to get good paying jobs. Your vote for me this November will make sure, will, I'm sorry, will allow me to continue to be your voice in Montpelier, where I will make sure our colleges understand the struggles, I'm um, sorry, where my colleagues to understand the struggles of rural communities to fund our schools, keep our cars on the road, maintain our roads, heat our homes, find good paying jobs, daycare, and affordable housing. Thank you, Dan. And now we have Mike King, who is running as an independent. He is a seventh generation Vermonter. He lives in Johnson, uh, attends Northern Vermont University. Uh, he recently told Basement Medicine, the uh, newspaper for the college, that he came to pursue his passion for writing. But after having children, he decided he wanted to run to make Vermont a better place for them. Uh, in May, he told our newspaper in a letter to the editor and to the public, uh, I am a business owner, I am a father, I am a student at Johnson State with a high GPA, I am a military vet, I am an outdoorsman and a gun owner, and I am also an employee. He owned the uh, King Family Trading Post in Johnson and a contracting company. Hi, Hi, thank you, and thank you to the News and Citizen for hosting this debate. Um, as you said, I don't have a political background. Um, I don't have a degree in political science. I am running for the people of Vermont, the working class people. I grew up in a poor family. Um, I saw my mother struggle with three jobs to support me and my brothers in a single family home. And I think that the working class is still suffering. And I believe that it's, the time is now for people to be elected in Montpelier that are looking out for the working class. We are going to uh, start the questions from us, and we will. The first question will be for for Dan Noyes, uh, gentlemen. Uh, your district covers nearly the entire width of Lamoille County. Uh, how would you describe the unique needs of your district, from Northern Vermont University all the way down to Bog Road? Bonus points if you know where Bog Road is. So, you know. Um, the communities all have a, a lot in common, whether you're up in, in Belvedere or North, North Woolkit. Um, people are um, concerned about uh, their taxes. People are concerned about access to health care. Um, you know, it's... Um, that whole swath across the northern part of Lamoille County all have a lot, lot in common with each other from, as I said, from, you know, all the towns. Um, you know, Johnson does have Northern Vermont University, which is an important aspect to the town. Um, so I'd say they're, they're pretty similar. 
Mike. Yeah, we have a pretty unique we have a pretty unique district. We have a lot of different people. We have the people out in rural Belvedere and rural Wolcott where you can only get there three months of the year because mud season's too bad to uh, get all the way up there. Then we have the people in town and the people with uh, Northern Vermont University. Uh, I'm, an, I'm a student there as well. Um, basically what I've seen while traveling around is a lot of people have the same concerns, property taxes, the tax burden. Um, Vermont is just becoming unaffordable. And if you drive any of those back roads, you'll see more for sale signs than you will political signs. And I think that's pretty telling about our district that people just simply can't afford to live there anymore. Uh, so yeah, like uh, I mean, I'd, I'd agree uh, that there's, you know, the the rural towns are very similar, really. Uh, you know, even the more popular ones in Johnson High Park, they're still very similar to um, you know Belvedere and Wilkett. Uh, the the main focus really should be protecting what we have and building on what we already have now. And uh, you know, we have Northern Vermont University, and uh, um, I submit my first year. Uh, I submitted the bill to increase their, their base funding just to like, keep their doors open. I mean, that's how bad I think the previous debate ever mentioned that uh, uh, we are currently about, well, depending on which measure you look at, 48th, 49th, or 50th as far as uh, state funding into the state college system, uh, which is actually a, like, just abysmal. And, uh, and so if we can protect what we have, we have the electric co-op, you know, we, we, we do have good paying jobs. Uh, we, uh, there is opportunity for people. Um, and it's just matching up people with the right jobs and getting them the right skills and training to, to get those jobs. Uh, so, you know, our little, uh, you know, our belt of Lamoille County uh, is not uh, unlike each other. We have, we're very similar. We have the similar needs, uh, which, which uh, you know, makes our jobs not easier, but uh, it, it makes our policy decisions that we can make uh, that much straightforward. And I hope that, uh, you know, we... we we can build on workforce development initiatives and not so much, um, you know, bolstering the, the very large institutions. We can just make sure that they have the people that they need to, to make a good go of it in the rural towns. Thank you. So next question. Um, we heard this one in the first debate, but we will ask you this too. What do you think about no new taxes and fees? Does that work? Um, and what alternative sources of revenue could the state pursue to fund programs, projects, and personnel? Uh, so for this one, we will start with Mike. Um, I would love to see no new taxes and fees. Um, I think taxes are a direct correlation of our spending in the state. We have a lot of programs we really don't need to protect from honors. Um, in this last session, we have funded taxpayer legal counsel for illegal immigrants. Uh, we've seen a $59 million income tax increase, and now we're talking about paid family leave. And these are all great things, um, but I believe they're pipe dreams. And I believe that the tax burden on the working class, it's just too much. As I said before, it's, it's becoming impossible to live here. We have $8.3 billion in debt, and we only have $3.6 billion worth of assets to uh, pay for this debt. So I understand that our current legislature Later, later, excuse me, our current legislatures are trying to pass a bunch of taxes because they need to come up with this money to, to cover what we owe. But um, I believe that the solution lies in actually tightening our belts and maybe getting rid of a few programs. I don't know what programs, um, but I do believe that we need tax relief for the people that live here or they're going to keep leaving like they are now, our, both our elderly and our young people. So next we'll go to uh, Matt. Uh, so the uh, you know no new taxes, no new fees, you know works in the short term. That's fine, um, but that just wasn't the reality. I mean, even the governor signed a few bills that uh, created new fees. Um, so you know that's it's, it's a nice soundbite, um, maybe not necessarily realistic. Uh, you know you can't even you know even uh, you'll set up here in the previous debate that uh, you. Just look straight level funding forever um, may not may not work. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, and, and there there are certainly programs. <clears throat> Every year, you know, uh, you sit in a committee and you go through, um, you know, the department and their jurisdictions, and there's always a trimming going on here and there. There may be they may they may ask for a little more there, but you got to trim down over here to get that over there. 
Uh, you know, so and, and during that evaluation, we always say, well, you know, let's looks like you haven't even used this program or it's in the hole and it's probably time. Uh, a good example of that would be the uh, Vermont Life magazine that the state produced for a, for a you know promotion. Uh, you know, it's like three million dollars in the hole, and uh, we just uh, you know, in my, in my committee, we essentially said, all right, you know, enough is enough, just let it go. You know, if you want to keep the Vermont Life, um, you know, name and trademark, that's fine, but stop releasing magazines because it's just not making any money. Um, and uh, so it's, it's part of the process that happens often uh, in the state house, and it'll probably continue to happen. Um, as far as uh, you know, new taxes, um, uh, there was a lot of debate in the beginning of last year about marijuana, uh, you know, regulation and taxation, um, in which I supported the initial tax and regulate. Um, proposal, which uh, failed, I think it was 50 to 100. I can't remember. <laughs> it, was not, it wasn't even close. Um, and then later on in the year, it was introduced again by Don Turner, who is the Republican from Milton, who's now running for lieutenant governor. Um, and at that point, it was quite clear that uh, it wasn't going to pass, and it failed by even worse that time. But, but I think, you know, I think eventually we'll, we'll get around to it. But, uh, you know, I kind of feel like we did things backwards on that one. I think we could have had a regulate system first, and then on to what we have now, but uh, you know, it happened the way it happened, and I'm, I'm still okay with that. So. Thank you, Dan. All right, thank you. Um, so last session, I voted for budgets that did not increase taxes. I hope to do that in the upcoming um, sessions as well. Um, as far as fees. Um, I voted for a bill that would increase cell phone coverage, uh, impose fees on cell phones, because I want my cell phone to work, and that money's got to come from somewhere to get these cell phones to work. So I, don't, I do support fees um, at some level for different, you know, different particular things, but I think we can look at some of the programs that we, we run and hopefully hold the line on you know, some of the tax increase um, in the debate before, we heard a lot about crumbling infrastructure in Rutland, um, you know, and we also have a $1.6 billion teacher's um, pension fund uh, deficit that we're going to have to come up with the money for. So um, I am not on appropriation. Um, I, I think that um, we're going to have to really think about what programs that we're able to deliver um, and where money goes. Um, in order to keep, um, try to keep it as close as we can to, to no, no taxes. But I can see a lot of, I can see us looking at some fees to go up to be able to provide the services. Um, you know, whether it's the fact that people are now driving um, hybrid cars and not contributing to our roads like people did years ago with, um, you know, trucks that get 10 miles a gallon. Um, so we're going to have to figure out how we're going to pay for these roads, and, and there very well could be additional fees. But in terms of kind of the base tax rate, that's the number one thing I hear about. So thank you. Now that, <clears throat> excuse me, now that Vermont has uh, legalized marijuana, we'll start with you, Matt, since you uh, mentioned it already. Um, uh, Vermont's legalized marijuana, both its possession and use, as well as its uh, cultivation. Do you think it's time to proceed to a tax and regulate model? I showed my hand on that one already, didn't I? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I think it's time to uh, to do it. Uh, like, like I said before, uh, I I would um, I kind of feel we did it backwards. You know, we could have we could have had a regulate system first, and then let um, you know homegrown uh, be available, just like just like brewing is really, you know. Um, and uh, and so yeah, you know we don't we, when when we were talking about it initially, and I was part of the first kind of group of legislators to to do the initial push for a regulate system. Uh, a lot of pushback was was happening. You know, they they were saying things like, "Well, we don't want like a cartoonized you know pot leaf on a sign out front or something." And 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 I, and I get that; it's fine. Uh, we can regulate those things too. It's not like we can, you know, we can do things to make it, um, you know, not as in your face. Um, it's uh, one of those things where, you know, uh, the state controls all the liquor sales and they kind of control what they do um, as far as advertising and, and sales and stuff like that. So, no, I think it's, I think it's time. I think it was, it, it's been time for a long time to 
have a regulation system, and uh, and I'm not sure if uh, that'll happen this next year. Like I said before, it did not have very popular support, um, you know, last year. So uh, hopefully, some minds have changed, um, or maybe new faces too, and uh, hopefully we can get a, 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 you know, a good Vermont re uh, regulated system. Thank you. Dan, we'll go to you next. Sure. So I did vote for um, both the marijuana policy that we passed last session as well as a tax and regulate market. Uh, I would continue to support that. I don't think it's going to bring in a, as much money as um, – I don't think it's going to bring in a ton of money. I think we're um, competing now with the other states around us, and um, you know, it definitely will bring in some revenues. But we're going to also have to end up probably spending more on education and prevention and um, recovery. So you know, maybe it will be a good way to fund some of those programs around our problem we have with opiates. Um, so. Yes, I think it will be probably one of the early bills that we'll be voting on this session will be a uh, regulated market. Uh, I think it definitely it needs to be reg I think it definitely needs to be regulated, especially the edibles. Um, I have a three-year-old. If she finds one of those gummy bears on the floor somewhere, she's going to eat it. And uh, that's something that we don't want. Um, as a child grows up until about age 20, their their mind can actually be affected, and the growth of their mind can be affected by marijuana. It's not so harmful for, you know, older adults, but it definitely is for children. And I don't want to see any of those products fall into uh, the hands of children. I think advertisement needs to be regulated, the, similar to cigarettes or um, or alcohol. I don't want to see flashy rainbow, um, kid-friendly posters on the sides of buildings. Uh, as far as the market goes, I don't want to see regulation. I don't want to see the state pick and choose who can, who can uh, grow marijuana and who can sell marijuana. If we want to give this freedom to the people of Vermont, we need to give it to everybody. And I would like to see um, the sales regulated similar to how the state, they regulate alcohol and tobacco. They could send a, a sting operation into a, a place that, that sells it, and if they fail the the test, then they get penalized or they lose their license to sell it. Thank you all. Uh, what would you do to change the state's clean water laws or put teeth into existing legislation? Uh, Dan, we'll start with you on this one. Sure. So um, I was involved with the Lamoille River Anglers for years and did a lot of uh, stream bank restoration up and down the Lamoille River. And I think that we can actually, by engaging volunteers in service, really um, do a lot to preserve our, our waterways, slow runoff, and create a riparian buffer strip up and down the Lamoille River. I think that will really solve a lot of our problems. It will slow down the runoff that um, we see from the storms that we're getting, and um, will also uh, help clean, clean the water and, and cool the water because it will keep the sun off it a little bit with the, the buffer strip. So um, in terms of the regulations we have now with, with water quality, um, you know, I think we probably, um, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I think we're doing a pretty decent job trying to protect the waterways of Vermont. Um, we do end up with the local roads grant and trying to, we need to work on how municipalities are um, being basically told by the state to um, make sure that the runoff from the roads doesn't go in the river. And we've got to um, make sure that's, that's funded if the state wants that and um, also make sure that the towns know how to, how to deal with these local road grants. Uh, Mike, your thoughts on clean water legislation? Uh, yes, anyone that followed the news this spring, um, we, we all witnessed hundreds of thousands of gallons of raw sewage being dumped into Lake Champlain. And I, I did know that there, I did see that there was a bill for a uh, lake cleanup, but I don't think we should address the cleanup until we address the problem. These municipalities, they need to be held accountable for dumping the sewage into the lake. Um, we'll regulate, uh, it's funny to me because we'll regulate a logger for driving too close to a stream here in Wolcott, um, but we won't regulate and put pressure on these municipalities to update their dinosaur infrastructure. 
And I think, I think clean water is important. I think everybody thinks clean water is important. And I would, I would like to see lake cleanup, but I would also like to see uh, the people that are causing this pollution held accountable for it. Everything that was stated so far, really, uh, um, you know, this is it's a big issue. There's a lot of things going into the lake. There's a lot of things going into the streams. Um, this isn't a, you know, oh, we fixed one thing and all of a sudden, poof, our water is clean again. Um, so it, it's going to be a, a, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bear to tackle. We've been struggling with it for a long time. And if you've ever been to St. Albans Bay in the past five to ten years, uh, you can instantly see the issue. Um, it's pretty easy to point out when the when the lake looks like it's uh, green paint is uh, you know dumped into St. Albans Bay, um, but like I said, it's not that's not going to be a, a one one you, you, know, you 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 find Burlington's pants off for dumping their sewage in the lake, that's fine. But uh, we also have uh, you know our our streams our roadsides need to be cleaned up. <clears throat> you know we got to make sure manure is not going into the rivers and streams, and we got to make sure phosphorus from other manufacturing processes aren't. Um, going into the river streams too, so it's it's going to have to be a full on you know assault here. We can't just uh, you know pick and you know pick on one group or one group or the other. We have to make sure everyone's involved and everyone's going to have to do their part to make sure our waters are clean. <clears throat> and uh, I like to mention too, Lake Champlain gets all the the press, but uh, it's far from the only one. I think we have I think it was Lake Carmine has a really bad problem too, and it's uh, and it's not getting better anytime soon. So we're going to do something quickly. Okay, uh, uh, next question is for Mike King. Uh, do you think the state is on track to meet uh, its renewable energy goals and uh, what more could be done? Um, I think that we've seen some great things and some not so great things. There are solar farms uh, popping up across the state. Those are great. I think we made a mistake with the wind towers. Uh, you drive through Lowell and they, they not only aesthetically are horrific and uh, they ruined a great bear population and uh, they're hardly ever running and I've also heard complaints that we're not we're not seeing any revenue from them I think we need a, a good balance of renewable energy and actually fossil fuels um, I don't think we have the technology right now to run everything off green energy and if we did it would be great but we need to still u utilize fossil fuels while working our way toward renewable green energy So uh, we've, uh, you know, we've, there's been a lot of talk lately about a carbon tax and that kind of thing. And, and I personally have not been in favor of a carbon tax. I think we should uh, bring back uh, these solar incentives. Uh, you know, I think the technology is there. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think it's in solar. I, you know, I would not want to see more windmills go up. Um, you know, and I don't even mind the look of them. I don't, you know, it's just some people just don't like them at all, and uh, and that's fine. But uh, you know, if, if 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 there was an incentive in place uh, to put solar panels on your roof, um, just like like right now, I'm I, I would totally do it. But it's just a little too much for me to bear right now. And if there was just an, an extra little incentive to have me help me get solar panels on my roof to you know neutralize my carbon footprint, then I would totally do it. Um, and uh, and so that's what I think the state should be doing as far as. Uh, Improving green energy, we, we should, just should bring back the incentives, um, and then those coupled with federal incentives um, will make it very easy for homeowners to put panels on their roofs. Dan, I think we need to keep um, keep up the mix of our renewable energies um, along hydro and uh, and solar. Um, I know that just recently I was just down talking to Craig Mayotte about the relicensing for the more, uh, Green Reservoir Dam, and you know it's been a, that decision has now been a, appealed. He's looking at the fact that the license does not really allow him to operate it um, pro with some profitability, but no one's turning their lights off. So we've got to figure out ways to generate power here. Um, you know, right now we're looking at. Um, oil costs or carbon costs that are, you know, for gasoline in that $3 range, they're going to go up. They're going to end up being, you know, 5 or $6 again like they were when we started the wood bank and started cutting firewood for people so they could heat their homes. So um, I think 
that we need to continue on with trying to figure out ways to get more solar. Solar um, definitely brings in um, that peak demand, you know, when electricity um, is needed in the summertime. It's usually when the sun is shining, air conditions are going. So um, I think home solar is, is a good way. We should continue to promote that any way we can. It creates jobs. But we also need to find that balance about how we regulate um, existing hydro facilities and make sure that the electric companies can make investments in them to have the latest technology. Up at Green River Reservoir, it's like 1985 technology up there. And, um, you know, we may need to look at how we operate that dam um, and find that, like I said, find that balance between the recreational, ass, uh, the recreational the recreational part of the reservoir and um, and how we generate electricity and, and um, have a look. So, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what do you think can be done to retain or attract young people and young families to this area to live here and to work here? Uh, we'll start with uh, Dan for this one. Sure. So um, I'm on the board for... Um, Vermont Commission on National Community Service, Serve Vermont, and that's the board that um, runs the AmeriCorps programs. And if we were to uh, figure out a way to double the uh, educational benefit that AmeriCorps members get so that when they come to Vermont and serve in Vermont that they can go to college here, we're competing nationwide to get these young people to come and serve at our nonprofits through the AmeriCorps program. And if we could entice them to go to school here or use their educational, the federal educational benefit they get from serving in AmeriCorps. Um, so if, the, if they stayed, went to Northern Vermont University, um, it would be a way to, to bring people into our community. Um, it, we, we can see that 60 to 70% of the AmeriCorps members pretty much stay where they, where they serve. So. Um, I would really work, I'm going to be obviously introducing some bills around increasing AmeriCorps programs um, in Vermont. One of the ones that I did last time that didn't get a lot of traction was to um, have AmeriCorps members at our tech centers repairing the emission systems on people's cars as a way to ga uh, gain job skills and also so that people um, don't have their check engine light on and can't get an inspection sticker. So I thought that would be a, a good way to, to uh, solve that problem and also get young people to stay here in Vermont. Thanks, uh, Mike. I'll try to answer this question in the time frame, but it's a pretty <laughs> complex question. I think there's a lot of things uh, we need to address. Our health care costs, our housing, and our utilities, they're all above the national average. It's expensive to live in Vermont. Um, Child care costs are another one. We just passed two really, excuse my language, but they're bonehead um, acts that regulate child care facilities. And I've talked to a lot of daycares around uh, Lamoille County. And basically to watch your children, someone, uh, everybody at the facility pretty much needs to have the equivalent of a social, of a associate's degree. And I think that that's driving child care costs. Uh, Round Hill Kids is a great example in Hyde Park. They've had two people working there for 20, year, 20 plus years each, and now they can't be head teachers anymore because the state is saying that they aren't qualified. Um, I let my mother watch my children. I let my father watch my children. They don't have associate's degrees. I think we need to take a common sense approach to um, helping the child care providers so working class families can actually afford child care. I'm a victim of the child care crisis. We live off one income because with my wife's so associate's degree, it's simply not worth it to, for her to go to work. Uh, I think it would be, we figured it out, it's like 60% of her pay would uh, go to child care costs. And when is it worth going to work uh, for 30% of, of a base pay? So I think that and perhaps looking at zoning issues, let people build the houses and the apartments that they want to build um, as long as they're not negatively impacting the, the community and uh, we create more affordable housing and people will stay here. I know I read an account of 
a medical student actually that was leaving the state because of his college debt and the, the cost of housing in the Burlington area. Um, he could go elsewhere, I believe it was Pennsylvania maybe, and make more money and have affordable housing. And then, until we make Vermont affordable, young people aren't gonna stay here and they're not gonna come here. So a, a common misconception is that young people aren't moving here at all, uh, which is not true. We've seen the numbers over the past five years where uh, more younger uh, millennial aged kids, more were coming in than, than going out. Uh, so people you know, do want to live here. It's not a, uh, you know, it's a great place to live, and I think people recognize that. It's pretty easy. Um, but what's, what's really hard for people to, to, to stomach is being able to live in a, in a, you know, you know, in a uh, suburban area or you know, the Brompton area and you know, live and have a decent job. Um, but nowadays, uh, more and more people are working from home, um, and they can't work from home if they don't have a good Internet connection. Uh, so I think that's the number one thing holding back Vermont right now is uh, the inability or the, the maybe the political will is not there to actually in, invest in the infrastructure as far as the high-speed internet goes. Uh, you know, I have a bunch of my friends. I have a, you know, one friend lives in Boulder, Colorado. One friend lives in New York City. Uh, both of them would come back to Vermont in a heartbeat and could even work in the job they have now from, you know, from Vermont. Um, but it's just simply not uh, the, the, the capabilities of, the, of Vermont's infrastructure as far as uh, high-speed internet goes simply doesn't exist. Um, you know, they need more than the uh, consolidated communications seven download, one up. They're, you know, they need at least 25 down, 10 up, and that's the bare minimum. And you have to live in a town center or Burlington to, to do that. And, and many of them still love the country and want to be in the country. It's just they just can't, they just can't do it. So. That would be a great way to attract more younger people. Okay, we uh, skipped over you, Matt, so sorry about that. Uh, we'll start with you. Um, okay, our, our current state's attorney was defeated in the primary election after just one term in office. <clears throat> uh, people who opposed him say he concentrated too much on giving offenders second chances. And for those who supported him, he was ahead of the curve in promoting rehabilitation and restoration. What are your views, all of you, on uh, criminal justice when it comes to lock them up versus give them help? Uh, yeah. That's a, uh, it is me, right? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> that is a tough question. So, um, and I understand that job is probably not easy. Uh, I think the job was mishandled. Um, so there's that, but uh, you know there there are some issues that we have begun talking about in the legislature. There was uh, bail reform initiatives that were brought, and it was more of a line of uh, you know there shouldn't be a you know pay to get out. It's you know either you did something really bad and you you're going to be in jail, or you know or you're not a threat to society, and uh, you know you can go home while while you wait for your trial. Um, so uh, you know it's a, it's a fine balance that needs to be had here. Um, some people who are, you know, maybe maybe they're a drug user. Um, I don't think they necessarily need to stay in, in jail. Uh, they may they could probably get out. Uh, however, if you kill somebody while you're on drugs, you should probably stay in jail for your trial. Um, so there's a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's not an easy job. And there's a fine line to walk, but uh, I think we can address some of the issues with bail reform, uh, and and then and then the, the rest with uh, criminal justice reform. So Dan, we'll go to you next. Sure. So, um, in our in our committee, we we talked about making sure that people who are um, addicted to opiates that create, you know, um, commit crimes have access to care so that they can hopefully not continue down that path. Um, I, um, in terms of. Um, you know, if you, you said lock them up or, or rehabilitate. So, you know, um, we get a lot of people talking about our tax rates, and it's very expensive to lock them up. And so we're looking at, you know, sending them out to private prisons to try to reduce the cost. Um, we've got to find that balance where um, we're rehabilitating people, making sure that the... Um, 
restorative justice programs are accountable and that people are, um, you know, moving forward with employment or not going down the same path that they've been on because we really can't, um, we can't afford to um, put people in jail. Now, the one that was just referenced where if someone kills somebody, um, you know, in that particular, they probably should have asked to hold the person without bail. However, um, unless they're a risk of flight, it's in our laws that um, you, you, can't, um, you can't hold them uh, if they're not gonna be a threat to the community. So we're kind of getting us kind of a tough situation there where this person was killed. And, um, you know, my daughter went to the prom with him. So I know Dexter and, uh, you know, and uh, I don't think that situation was probably handled as it, sh as it could have been. But I'll leave it at that. I think the punishment needs to fit the crime. Um, if we're throwing people in jail for not being able to afford to get their truck or car inspected, then they obviously shouldn't go to jail. Um, if people have an addiction problem, but they're not harming anyone but themselves, they need to be offered treatment instead of thrown in jail. I think there are other cases such as drug traffickers where we're not holding them accountable enough. Um, for trafficking heroin, it's a maximum of three years. And for selling heroin on school grounds or to a minor, it's a maximum of 10 years. We're giving heroin traffickers an avenue and a great place to make money when they can make tens of thousands of dollars each run. Um, we're telling them, hey, you're welcome in Vermont. And that's obviously increasing our crime rate. We're seeing a lot more B&Es. We're seeing um, people's stuff getting stolen and resold for drugs. And I think that when, when we, we look at uh, the drug epidemic, we have a lot of other issues as well, like 33 out of 1,000 babies are born in the state of Vermont opiate dependent, and that's, a, that's the future of our state right there. Well, I think we need to concentrate on punishing the traffickers and helping our friends, neighbors, and relatives that are addicted to these poisons. We need to give them affordable, accessible treatment. Um, it's worked in Portugal. Portugal has a great recovery right now since um, they've lessened their their uh, stance on drugs. And I think it could work here if we're open-minded and willing to pursue it. Uh, so for this one, we'll start with Mike. Um, describe what the phrase sensible gun legislation means in 2018. I don't believe in sensible gun leg legislation because I don't believe that the statistics are there to uh, support it. And uh, I could speak all day on gun legislation, but the reality is in 2016, we had only 11 gun deaths. That's counting suicides and accidents and death by um, police officer, law enforcement. And to put that in perspective, we've had 64 traffic deaths in that year and 101 opiate overdoses that were fatalities. Uh, even VPR in a study between 2011 and 2016 said that uh, gun violence only accounted for 1% of the death rate in Vermont. And the majority of those are suicides. And uh, let's face it, I think everyone in this room would agree that if someone wants to kill themselves, it doesn't matter if they have a, a gun or not. I've had relatives that have hung themselves. And um, I think that's really what we need to look at is maybe mental health and getting these people that are hurting inside treatment. Um, we need to address school security. Telling people they can't own a gun isn't gonna stop a madman from getting a gun and going to a school and shooting it up, unfortunately. But increasing school security with, with uh, Lamoille's doing a great job. They have a sheriff on duty at all times. And I, I think that's a step in the, the right direction. And maybe we need to look at metal detectors and definitely need to look at human interaction when people are entering the school. They should be asked, why are you here? Who are you here for? And where are you going? Um, I hear a lot of pushback on that, that aesthetically it's not pleasing to see our students in that type of environment, but I really don't care how the school looks, I guess. I have small children and in 2018, I want them to be safe when, when they're getting their education. Um, I don't see any statistics that backed up any of the gun control legislation. I, I find it unconstitutional and I also believe when you get into 
warrantless search and seizure, you're on a very slippery slope and uh, a lot of other constitutional rights could slowly be eroded because of it. Uh, Matt, what is sensible gun legislation to you in 2018? <clears throat> so I'm not sure what uh, sensible gun legislation would be. Um, truthfully, I don't put a whole lot of thought into gun legislation or not gun legislation. <clears throat> I never did. I didn't get elected to, you know, to, to make those kinds of decisions. I got elected to work on workforce development issues and economic development issues. And this bill came up. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, you know, we ended up where we landed, and we took a very big step. Um, and I, you know, so going forward, I wouldn't think that we need to do anything for, a, a, you know, at least a little while. You need to see how things shake out um, with the current legislation and, uh, and go, you know, if we have to go on from there, we go on from there. But, uh, you know, like I said, we took a really big step. And, uh, yeah, and I hope we don't need to do it again because I hope that, you know, that would make, make it, you know, hopefully that would be a little... Uh, more safe, and hopefully it'll be a, a, a good issue for Vermont. Dan. Okay. Um, sensible gun legislation. Uh, I would say that um, we're lucky to live in a very safe state like we live in. Um, I think that um, I'm not sure that we need to really change any gun legislation that's out there that we've that we have, um, that we, you know, um, I would just, I don't think people want the um, restrictions on what they can own for firearms. I don't think that's, um, I think we need to look at school safety. We need to look at making sure our mental health systems are, are um, adequately there to take care of people. And um, I would, just leave it that our gun laws are fine the way they were. Um, so we touched on it briefly in the previous question, but um, how are we as a state handling the opiate crisis? And locally, um, what more do you think can be done if it needs to be? Um, so for this one, we will start with Matt. Uh, so, yeah, we have... Uh, <clears throat> The opiate crisis, you know, has uh, it's, it's 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 certainly it's been out of control. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, kind of started with my generation. Um, you know, it's kind of a take a pill and everything's all set. You're good to go, um, and uh, and it's extremely spiraled. Uh, you know, we've done everything from raising penalties on users to the traffickers, and we lower the penalties, higher uh, Eventually, we got to get to the, the actual point of the problem, and it's um, at some point. You know, this isn't. Um, you know, people in uh, you know in Afghanistan necessarily shipping their drugs over. It usually starts with uh, someone taking a pill that was produced by a company. Um, so, I think we seriously need to start looking at what we can do about the executives of those companies and how they sell their their drugs to the, the kids of Vermont. You know, it's a uh, it, 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 they obviously want to sell their product and make a profit, um, but. At, at the same time, it's also destroying our communities. And, um, and, and I don't know how else we can stop it other than making sure that uh, there's a penalty for knowingly selling an addictive substance to young kids. Mike. I rambled about this before, and I pretty much said uh, a lot of what I wanted to say on it. Um, this isn't Vermonters. Uh, a little bit it's Vermonters, but it's it's mainly people from places like New York and Springfield, Massachusetts that are bringing this stuff in into our state. And, uh, yeah, there's a market for it here. People are addicted. I don't think that we should hold people um, to... to uh, I don't think we should really punish people harshly for for having a sickness and being addicted. I think we need to hold those traffickers accountable. We need to send a message that they're not welcome here in Vermont and that if they come here and they get caught, they're not going to get six months probation. They're going to get 10 years in the slammer. And um, I would even be as radical to say that tell them never to come back, send them home and tell them never to come back. Uh, I think affordable, accessible treatment is also another big part of it. We need to 
we don't need studies to tell us we have a drug problem. And I see that in Montpelier. We need a study. We need to know how it's affecting us. We already know that it's here. We already know it's a problem. And if we don't take action and we keep ignoring it, it's just going to fester and get bigger. Um, it's also not a, a problem that only Vermont has. We're seeing it all over the country. But we definitely need to provide better accessible treatment and harsher penalties for the people bringing it here. Um, so right now we're spending $37 million on medically assisted treatment. And I'm interested to know the accountability of that. How many people are getting out of those programs and then coming right back into them? And it's probably pretty high. We are only spending um, $2.4 million on recovery. Um, and last session we were able to get some more money um, through it. There was a... Um, there's a tax on pharmaceuticals that was in some account. And so um, we talked to appropriations and uh, Chip Torriano is the rep from Hardwick and I um, were able to get some more money towards the recovery centers because we find that people coming out of the medically assisted treatment are you know, basically put out into the community and it would be better for them to have the resources to help them get employment and get into recovery programs so that they don't end up back in the same boat um, and back in that $37 million um, pot of money that we're spending. So um, I think we need to really look at the outcomes on the MAT and hold those um, programs accountable for to make sure that when the people come out, they don't end right back up in there. And, um, you know, make sure that we're continuing to invest in in prevention programs. Okay, uh, on to healthcare. Back, uh, I was over at the um, Lamoille County Mental Health Services today, and I uh, uh, it was a it was a group meeting. They're talking about their their needs, and the director said that uh, Lamoille County Mental Health Services annual budget is fourteen million dollars. Uh, UVM Medical Center uh, has a one point three billion dollar budget. Uh, locally here, Copley gets dinged uh, for bringing it too much revenue. Is the Green Mountain Care Board doing a fair job at setting hospital budgets? And how can there be made more money made available for dedicated agencies like Lamoille County Mental Health Services? Start with Dan. Sure. What was the last part of that question? I'm sorry. How can there be made, more money be made uh, <coughs> available for dedicated agencies like Lamoille County Mental Health Services that aren't governed by the Green Mountain Care Board? Okay, so uh, I guess I'll answer the Green Mountain Care Board because um, you asked if they, if you thought, if I thought they were needed. And, um, you know, the Green Mountain Care Board is not, doesn't have any doctors on the Green Mountain Care Board. They're mostly lawyers. And um, they were originally set up to um, regulate an all payer model that we don't have. So I'm not sure why we continue to, um, to have that type of regulation over our um, over our hospital. And we were just told um, that the they weren't allowed to make the, the level of profit that they, they needed in order to um, to continue by the Green Mountain Care Board, who basically came up with a, a much smaller number and told them that they had to live within that particular number, um, which was four four percent instead of um, like seven or eight percent um, profitability, and um, you know, I think that we look at what Copley's doing in terms of making sure that um, they're able to bring in revenues from joint replacement and other types of surgeries that are not um, not medic, you know, not um, they're they're able to get more revenues from those out of um, through. People that, that want to have um, better access. I know my, my dad had his knees replaced, and he uh, definitely improved his mobility. So it's a good thing to have that. And uh, um, But I hope I kind of answered your question. Good enough. Uh, we'll go to Matt then. All right, so uh, like Dan said, the Green Mountain Care Board said to, to take care of an all-payer model, which doesn't exist. Um, which is unfortunate. Uh, they do try to keep uh, prices down on health care as far as insurance rates and 
Uh, and the point of limiting a, a profitability of a hospital is um, to try to keep healthcare costs down also. Uh, we can debate uh, if that works or not, and it may not. Um, but penalizing a hospital for doing a good job is just ridiculous. Um, it's, you know, it, 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 there, there shouldn't be an issue about having a specialty here or there, and if you, you can go to this hospital to get the specialty for this. I know I had my, my ankle surgery was at Copley, and um, they did a great job. And uh, so it, it's, it's one of those things where uh, we should be incentivizing um, cheaper healthcare uh, and, and, and cheaper hospital visits. We shouldn't be penalizing um, or, or twisting the arms of hospitals for, uh, for doing a good job. Unfortunately, this is what happens when you have a board that wields all the power and sets all the rates. Um, I understand that with Copley's auto, um, operating costs, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board was concerned with them taking orthopedic uh, patients away from Chittenden County. I really think it needs to be a free market. I think if people want to go to Copley for, for uh, orthopedic care, they should have the choice to do so. I don't think we need to start regulating where people go to get their coverage. I think that uh, Copley's operating budget is, you know, they're, they're not doing too well, and part of that is because we're not, we're, we don't have the, the labor force here to support it, and uh, we need to take that orthopedic money, if we can get it, I guess, to, and maybe start looking at ways how we can... Um, encourage people to get into the nursing field so we're not paying fewer employees overtime wages to cover shifts that can't be filled otherwise. Uh, I would say to answer your question that I don't think the Green Mountain Care Board should be making a decision on where people receive their care. Uh, so here is a question. We will start with uh, Mike first. Um, how do you reflect your national political party and if you have not chosen to align yourself with a political party, why not? I don't choose to align myself with a political party because I believe that being part of a political party, um, it limits me. I would say I'm probably closest to libertarian. Um, I'm pro-choice, so that makes it pretty much impossible for me to be a Republican around here. But I'm also fiscally conservative, which makes it hard to be a Democrat. Um, I actually give Dan Noyce credit for voting against the, uh, going against his party and voting against the gun legislation because I think everybody needs to question their party. Everybody needs to say, is this what's best for Vermonters? And instead of just voting the way that our the House Majority Leader wants us to vote. Uh, Dan, next. Sure, can you repeat the question, please? Um, yeah, how do you reflect your national political party? So I'm running as a Democrat, and um, I believe that um, it's our responsibility through government to really look out for older Vermonters and children. And I feel that um, the Democratic Party um, is concerned about making sure that the services are available for older Vermonters and um, chose to align with them. However, um, I'm more interested in voting for the needs of the, you know, the people of Belvedere, Hyde Park, Johnson, and Woolkit. So um, it's not about party. It's about how we get things done and how we um, think about rural communities and what impact our legislation um, will have on them. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, as a, as a Democrat, too, it's... Uh, I think Democrats in general, and especially nationwide, need to get back to their roots and start working for the working class person, making sure they have skills available, make sure they have jobs that pay good wages, um, and, and those kinds of things. Middle class is essentially non existent nowadays. We don't, uh, you know, we're, we're so far behind in terms of wages, our wages have stagnated, um, and people can't pay their bills. Um, and so the Democratic Party, in my opinion, needs to get back to doing what they did before, um, and it's actually making sure that uh, people who work 40 hours um, don't have to live on starvation wages. And uh, I think this is the last one before audience questions. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, we will start with, with Matt Hill. 
Uh, what would your dream committee uh, be if you were reelected, and uh, what would your uh, top three priorities be within that committee if you could get it? So it's actually the committee I'm on right now. Um, I, I, I loved being on the Commerce and Economic Development Committee. Uh, we did a ton of work. We, we, we also take um, consumer protection issues also. Uh, so we did a ton of work uh, on data broker issues, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have workforce development um, issues. Uh, and we had just talked, uh, we had just touched on um, apprenticeship programs and that kind of thing um, last year, but couldn't, do, couldn't quite get as much as I had wanted to get. Um, and so this upcoming year, it'd be great to work on actual real apprenticeship programs, uh, really bolster the, the, the state, the Department of Labor ha already has an apprenticeship program. And it'd be great to bolster that. Um, we have a, uh, you know, trades industry, which, which I'm in as a carpenter, that's uh, it's aging out, um, and it's very hard to find enough people um, to do the work that's available. I turn down jobs all the time, um, and I which is sometimes it's nice because I get to pick and choose. I don't have to climb on a roof anymore usually, um, and that's really nice. But uh, but at the same time, it shows a, a very big weakness in the in the economy. We are losing people like crazy. Um, you know, people uh, in the current trades now. I think their average age is fifty five. Um, and if you've ever done manual labor, you know that a uh, 55-year-old, um, his body is probably not holding up as well as it uh, did when they were 30. Um, so uh, I would really like to put more emphasis on um, you know, trades, training. Um, as was mentioned in the last debate, too, that uh, we have our uh, tech centers all across the state who have amazing uh, uh, buildings and, and services there. And it would be great to get them up and running to a point where they could service um, not just Students, I know they do have adult programs, but um, if we can make sure that uh, the training is available for more adults, it would be a, a great help to Vermont. Uh, so Dan, same question. So I've been serving on the Human Services Committee, and I hope to be back on that committee if I'm reelected. Um, I think one of the things that I really want to work on is making sure that um, Meals on Wheels programs are adequately funded and that we're at least reimbursing those meals at $4. Um, the fact that we're at like three dollars and sixty cents, or somewhere around there, is is um, is not helpful for these programs that um, can possibly keep people in their homes and out of the hospitals if they have adequate nutrition. So um, that would be one of the things um, I put in a bill last session to make it part of the Choices for Care program. I would I would reintroduce that bill. Um, I also am interested in looking at how. We have access for transportation um, for older Vermonters and making sure that um, we promote programs that, that will help provide that, whether it's getting them to medical appointments or um, getting people to the store just to be able to live in our rural communities. We don't have fixed route transportation. It's, um, it's pretty costly to run that here in, in rural communities. So those are the two in in my committee that i'm i'm really interested in and then also looking at outside of my committee so can i go outside of my committee with a particular bill um okay uh last session i introduced a bill that um took the number of supervisory unions and reduced it to 17 and that is one for each tech center and then one for children who are incarcerated or um being taken care of by the state so um I would like to see us look at our supervisory union structure that we currently have that has 59 supervisory unions and try to get a handle on some of the um, education costs. I think that some of the um, programs we implemented around um, special ed will, will show some savings in the next, in the coming couple of years. So I think between those two things we should be able to slow down some of the, and keep the small school grants. Um, I'd like to work on a little bit of everything. <laughs> I mean, I, I see a lot of problems that need to be addressed uh, with education. You know, we can all preach about college all day long, but we have a VSAC program we haven't increased funding for in over a decade. Um, we, I, I agree with Matt, we're not promoting the trades enough. I work in the trades. It's a very honorable business. I make more as a paint contractor than I'll ever make with my bachelor's degree. So um, I, I don't think college is up for everybody, and I think we need, to, we need to find out what our youth's good at, and a lot of that is through the tech center and, uh, you know, and 
uh, sending them to vocational schools or, or just giving them a purpose that they want to pursue. Um, I like Dan's committee. I think he does some great things with the elderly. Uh, they're a vulnerable population. I want to see them protected. I'd like to see Meals on Wheels continue as well. Um, I know a lot of people that can't cook, and Meals on Wheels is one of the things that keeps them out of the nursing home. And I think uh, as far as that committee goes, that should be the overall goal is making sure that people can live with dignity in uh, their, their home. So. Now we'll open it up if anyone from the audience has any questions that they would like to ask. My name is Enrique Caesar. I'm a professor in Northern Vermont University. I'm speaking the microphone because I have an accent, so I make sure everybody understands what I'm saying here. So I heard a lot from the candidates, especially from the Democrat candidates here, that uh, funding, 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 funding. That's probably the word that you guys said the most here, funding this, funding that. So the question I have is this. This funding, obviously, is going to be through taxes. You know, that's probably the, the only way when you say funding, automatically you think about taxes. I would like to know if you have any idea how to fund this without increasing or without using tax money. For example, Belvedere community, getting together and help the elderly people somehow as a community, not needing a government assistance or anything like that. And the reason why I ask that is because my personal history is I came here, what, 20 years ago without speaking English, without even having a green card. I was a legal immigrant for two years. And I spent uh, 15 years without government assistance or anything. I was able to go from a dishwasher to a uh, university professor. So following everything that this uh, state has you know, in place at that time, it was quite easy, actually, to do that without any assistance from the government. So I'd like you, you know, see if there's any idea or anything like that that you can without thinking about government assistance, how can you solve those problems? Do you want me to go first? Sure, go ahead, Dan. Sure. Um, so my job is to engage volunteers in service around helping people. So whether it's building wheelchair ramps or um, delivering Meals on Wheels, providing transportation, engaging communities in service is, is important. It's something we need to make sure we um, teach our children that um, it's important to serve one's community. Um, and I, I've been getting volunteers to plant um, stream banks. Um, I've been, uh, you know, um, always recruiting volunteers for anything that needs to get done within the community. So I think that's a, a way to really provide the services but not have the cost associated with it. Although I did find that you do need someone um, who can make sure there's enough nails and boards and stuff to, to build the wheelchair ramp because the volunteers show up and if there's no material there or no plans, they get a little, um, it doesn't go very well. <laughs> Matt, you want to take this? Sure. Uh, so, uh, just because uh, you know we say uh, increased funding or something like that does not necessarily mean um, we have to raise taxes for that. For example, I when I my first year I put in a bill to uh, increase the um, base payment to the state college system by four million dollars. Um, we actually ended up only getting three, but that's because we also put in a bunch of money to do the unification process to change the Northern Vermont University, um, and, and that didn't raise any taxes. That was. Uh, so simply a little cut here, cut there. All right, we got this little extra pot over here. This is going in. So just because we you know, may want to uh, allocate money differently does not necessarily mean we have to raise taxes to do that. So actually, we had, when we were at Johnson State College, we had 20% of the budget. And Lindbergh State had 20% of the budget. Mm -hmm. Now that we were unified, we had 33% of the budget. Mm -hmm. and then we got second to the That's it. I, 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 I would love to look into that. I wasn't, I did not, I wasn't aware of that. That's interesting. Okay. Mike, your thoughts on? Um, I think we need to prioritize what we're funding. I think there's, I don't think we need to uh, fund uh, paid family leave. I've, I'm not as, my story is not as impressive as Enrique's, but I, I mean, I came from nothing and I've built a life for myself and I did it without government assistance as well. And it can be done. Um, I think that some certain safety nets help people when they need it the most. But 
Uh, I truly believe that there's probably a lot of things that we're funding right now that we could we could cut funding to and put it toward things that maybe matter like Meals on Wheels and um, taking care of our vulnerable populations. So I, I think it's really just a matter of taking a look at the budget and saying, okay, this is not as necessary as this and uh, comparing and contrasting. I wouldn't support any new taxes on the working class. They can't afford the taxes they have now, so. Any other audience questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, Representative Roy has brought a very good point about volunteering and service. So my question is about volunteering service and school security. As Mr. King pointedly pointed out, that Act 94 has done nothing, nothing, to increase the security of schools and soft targets throughout the state. What I mean by soft target is that targeted, the facility is unprotected by any sort of active security measures in which an armed threat can come in and do untold damage under that facility and its personnel within. This being said, a way to actually have concrete school security would be as such as you put out a call for volunteers throughout the state and set up in, in hence a militia. And this militia would literally call from volunteers. They would have background checks done by the state police and the attorney general's office, training provided by the National Guard and force protection measures to be able to secure all soft targets throughout the state, not just schools, hospitals, nursing homes, rest homes, youth centers, gymnasiums and the like. Easily, there are over 30,000 veterans in the state that I'm sure would be more than willing to take up the call for volunteer security. And I want to know what your position on this possible solution to our school and soft target security crisis would be. Any takers? Is that everybody? Um, Matt? Sure. I'm here. Uh, as an interesting proposition, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, just just hearing it now is, uh, I can't say a yay or nay, definitely. Um, but uh, there was uh, money allocated to each of the school districts to do security updates and, and the like. Um, Lamoille, I can't remember what Lamoille got. I think thirty thousand, I believe it was what it was. But it could have been more than that. I, I can't remember now. But. Um, for, for, yeah, for the county, it's more, but Lamont Union High School by itself uh, got a, a pretty substantial uh, increase for security measures, and uh, and that's just a, you know that was a that was a quick first step that we had time to do, um, and uh, and I'd like to see more of that kind of thing. Yeah, sure. sure. Um, so a volunteer group that would um, be providing security to schools I would have to learn more about it my first thing would be probably not um, we have a sheriff's department we have a police department um, um, I, I mean I, I, I would have to learn more about it but I, I'd be willing to, to listen to more but at first take probably no um, I've already talked about guns at, at length in school security uh, Private security forces, I wouldn't be opposed to, but I would want accountability. Um, there's a lot of schools that already have their own security guards, and I, I think that works okay, and then it doesn't work okay. We saw the, a security guard um, stand in a stairwell uh, during the last uh, mass shooting, so I would prefer to see law enforcement, but if a school wants to hire a, a a uh, security guard that's gone through law enforcement training, I wouldn't be opposed to that as long as they pass all the necessary checks. Do you have one, Mr. Gravel? Yeah, I just uh, want to make a comment here. Is I thank you all for your comment. And uh, I want to say a special thanks to Mike for his common sense and the hard speaking. I think Mike has definitely got what we need in Montpelier. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to all three of you for, uh, for attending, and thanks to uh, everybody in the audience. Do we have any other questions? Go ahead. Hi, my name is Will Angier. Uh, my question is about paid family leave and uh, the increase in minimum wage. Uh, one is, do you support those? And if yes, uh, would you 
be opposed to perhaps moving forward with one piece of legislation before moving on to the next by meaning one legislative cycle and then moving into another one in the following legislative cycle just so we can see the effects of these changes? Uh, I, sure. Um, so I did. I supported both of those uh, measures. Uh, it would be a, uh, I mean, probably, you know, it wouldn't be a, a terrible idea to, to stagger them and not do uh, all at once. Um, but at the same time, we have a population that's living uh, uh, with wages that have uh, been stagnant for 50 years. Uh, you know, back in 1968, the minimum wage, the buying power for minimum wage was, eh, well, you could uh, probably 12 bucks an hour. It was maybe a little more depending on which inflation calculator you're looking at. Um, and that's like as in today, not as in three years from now or, or that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, so we're, we're essentially behind 50 years um, uh, for wages for the, for the lowest earners. Um, and as far as uh, paid family leave goes, uh, when a you know, minimum wage worker has to spend 60 cents a week um, and can uh, take six weeks off with 80% of that pay to care for a newborn baby or a dying grandmother, um, they can do that <coughs> with uh, having a little bit of financial security and not just completely losing their job and moving on. Um, and that which which is usually not a possibility for people making under fifteen dollars an hour, so they have to make a choice: do they go to work or do they take care of their loved one? Uh, which is obviously um, not an easy decision. And if we can help alleviate that situation, then uh, I think that would be best for for them. Mike, do you want to answer? Uh, yeah, I don't support either, and this is why. First of all, I've had two children within the last four years. I am me, nor, neither me nor my wife had paid family leave. We made it work. I mean, that's in life. Sometimes you got to make things work. If you're taxing people to take care of other people's fa uh, paid family leave, you know, you're taking away from those people that have to pay that tax. So, I don't want to punish one population to take care of another. Um, if it was a matter of life and death, maybe I'd look at it a little bit different. But for pretty much since our founding, we've, you know, we've done what we had to do to make things work. And I think that's part of being a responsible dad or a responsible mom. You need to, you need to make sacrifices. You want to have children, you're going to have to sacrifice some things. Um, you're not going to live the way you lived before. And I've learned that firsthand. Uh, as far as the minimum wage, when I first heard about this, I, I thought, wow, isn't that great? You know, everyone will be making $15 an hour, but it's not going to work. And, uh, and it's not going to work in Lamoille County. We could have Dollar General and um, Big Lots and Price Chopper and Smuggler's Notch. They could all afford $15 an hour, but, you know, the Village Motel can't afford $15 an hour for their housekeeping. They're barely staying afloat. We see small mom and pop businesses uh, closing every day, and uh, sometimes, like down here in Morseville, the building disappears altogether. And and you know that's the foundation of Vermont is the small the small business. And if we're making those people pay uh, a fifteen dollar an hour wage, they're not they're, they're not making profit now. They're definitely going to sink into the hole. And then and then all we're going to have in our state is the Dollar Generals and and the big chain stores. And then, you know, eventually those stores are gonna say this isn't economically viable and they're gonna move out of the state and we're gonna be left with nothing. So uh, every business I've talked to in Lamoille County, every single one has been against the $15 an hour minimum wage. And I would, I'll would i stand behind the businesses of Lamoille County. Um, even if I thought differently, I would vote the way that they wanted me to vote because ultimately they're gonna be the ones that get me elected. Um, so I, uh, I did vote for both $15 minimum wage and paid family leave. Your question about staggering them in um, is, is a good one. And, um, you know, it's something they should probably look at. The fact is we're, we may be close to being at that $15 when you see MSI is paying $15. Um, Copley pays everybody at least $15. A council on Aging, you know, a lot of the, um, there are a lot of businesses that are already there. And I would be interested to see the statistics on um, how many will be there by, what is it, 2024, which is when that would have taken effect. And uh, um, I, 
you know, one of the things I'm concerned about is, is how we make sure that the um, home health and personal care workers are um, adequately um, paid for the work that they do, but we also have to realize that, that a lot of that money comes through Medicare, Medicaid, and, and our taxes. So um, I believe that um, we passed a bill, the Older Vermonters Working Group, and it basically pulls all the agencies together that provide these services and looks at where we're going to be able to um, make sure that if we, when we do go to 15, or if we go to 15, um, how are we going to make sure we don't increase eligibility and cut services to the people that really need it? Um, so, good question. Do you have any other audience questions? Great. Thank you so much uh, for coming. Thank you to Green Mountain Access Television. Uh, thank you to People's Academy for providing this wonderful space. What? Oh, oh, yes, I'm so sorry. Uh, so we will go in a different order than the opening statements. Um, candidates have up to two minutes for a closing statement, if you wish. Uh, we'll start with Mike, and then go Dan, and then Matt. Obviously, I'm, I'm passionate about some of the issues that I've talked about tonight. Um, it's really an honor to be here. It's an honor to be a part of this process and to be able to have a, a forum to to say what direction I think that uh, Vermont should go in. And I've had great support, and I feel that other people agree with me. And um, it's okay to disagree with me on some things, too. I really believe a big part of government's meeting in the middle and compromising. And um, if we do that, and, and I would be one to compromise as well, if we do compromise and meet in the middle, I think we can make Vermont a much affordable, more affordable and better place to live. And ultimately, that is my goal. So, um, thank you again, Hannah and Tommy, for moderating this debate, and everybody for coming. Um, I'm honored to serve my community as your legislator. I brought new and creative ideas and reflected the values and the can-do attitude of Lamoille County. I brought legislators together to collectively address the issues facing older Vermonters. I made sure my colleagues understood the impact of legislation and changes policy would have to the residents of Belvedere, Johnson, Hyde Park, and Wolcott, and I voted accordingly. Um, there's still work to do. We may have eliminated the waiting list for inpatient treatment of addiction, but we need to further invest in recovery centers and prevention programs, and we'll need to hold the drug companies liable. Um, I've been working to find solutions to the check engine light and vehicle inspections the and also protect the air that we breathe and keep our roads safe through an AmeriCorps program that engages youth in service and teaching job skills. Last session, I voted for a budget that did not raise property taxes, and I hope to do so again. There are savings to be had in our education system by re restrict, um, restructuring the supervisory unions to align with our tech centers. There are savings that we are yet to realize and changes we made to how we provide special education last session. I ask for your vote on November 6th. If you have questions about my candidacy, perhaps you have an idea of how to make our community a better place, or if you're concerned about the impact of legislation in the upcoming session, please reach out to me. I'm here to listen. Sure. So thank you both for, for holding this. This has been great. Um, like, like I've said before, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've Greatly appreciate the support that, I, that I've been awarded the past two years, and I hope that continues. Um, I'm really looking forward to working harder for working class people, and like I said before, the trades, and uh, and, and just making sure that Vermont has the, the manpower to satisfy the needs of, of, of other Vermonters, too. So um, that's basically my main focus. I want to make sure that we have better paying jobs and more jobs. Um, and I think we've made a great, I made a great first step in that in the past two years, and I hope I had the opportunity to do it for another two years. Okay, now, thank you all so much for coming. Um, get out and vote Tuesday, November 6th. Thank you so much for all being here. This is great.